we're going to look at the regulation of gene expression in bacteria to be followed next week by the regulation of gene expression in eukaryotes. Okay, so we've, we've looked at, um, like I said, we've, as you know, we've done DNA replication, we've done transcription and translation, and in between those we did RNA processing and all of that. So we've got a pretty good idea of how the, um, during um, gene expression, we've got a pretty good idea of how the RNA polymerase, what it is and how it binds and how it trans transcribes a gene and, and how that process occurs. Okay? But what we're going to look now is actually at how that process is regulated. Okay? So um, we, talked, we mentioned the sigma factor being involved in um, the polymerase selecting the gene with the sigma factor. We had the heat shock genes and um, some other responsive genes that had their own sigma factors. But we're going to um, not revisit that, but we're just going to look at other methods of, of actually um, turning genes on and off rather than looking at the basal transcription machinery um, in isolation. Okay? So, like I said, this first lecture is looking at um, control of gene expression in bacteria. So, one thing um, that's worth noting is that in bacteria, you get um, clusters of genes which are regulated by a single promoter. All right, now, you don't have that in eukaryotes. So we have these, so what we say, that transcription, um, that we, we have these things called operons in bacteria. So we have um, this, this operon, and an, op, an operon is said to be, um, well, it, it's a collection of genes attached to a single promoter. All right? And when the messenger RNA is made from this operon, within that one messenger RNA, they may be um, translated into different proteins. So there might be, say, three different protein sequences on one messenger RNA. Okay? So um, effectively, um, we, we, we have a single promoter controlling an operon or a part of an operon which um, contains sequences for multiple proteins. Okay? Um, And I'll just clarify a little. The, when we looked at eukaryotes, we talked, we talked about alternative splicing to get different proteins from one gene. This is really different. This is actually different exons. Okay? They always give rise to the same protein. But, so you've got three exons giving rise to three proteins. And there's one promoter for those three exons. One promoter for those three genes. Okay? Um, now, we also have shown you some diagrams previously where you've got the polymerase moving along the DNA and the messenger RNA is coming out of the polymerase. And then we've got the ribosomes attaching to the messenger RNA and making the protein. And remember, you could have multiple ribosomes on the same messenger RNA making the same protein. You see? So we had, we had messenger RNA being read simultaneously by multiple um, ribosomes. Well, what's happening here, because it's a polycystronic messenger RNA, it's actually got a multiple binding sites. So it's got binding sites for the third gene, for the ribosome. It's got a binding site for the second you know, sequence on the, rib on the messenger RNA. And it's got, so it's got different sites where ribosomes can attach and then read in like you would in, in a normal uh, messenger RNA. Okay? So, um, multiple, um, so it's said to be polycystronic. Um, in other words, many genes within one poly, I'm not quite sure, um, cis meaning on the same, wouldn't it? Trans would be on opposites, so I'm not quite sure the derivation of, of the term polycystronic, but um, many things on the same strand, I think is what it's indicating. Okay? And, um, and then within that messenger RNA that's made, it's got these individual binding sites, um, so that some combined in the middle and then start reading, and some combined at the beginning, like normal, and start reading. And, and each of those can be read independently. All right, so generally we've been, I've been t talking to you about gene expression, and we've been looking at this flow of information from the DNA sequence through the messenger RNA to a protein, and I've been telling you about um, transcription, which is copying the messenger RNA from 
the DNA template, and we've been talking about translation, which is making the protein sequence from the messenger RNA. And all of this together constitutes gene expression. And um, so, you know, so a gene's expressed once the information content in the DNA is expressed as a protein. Um, so what we're looking at now is some of the processes that control, that turn these genes on and off, okay? And, and, and why a gene would be on and off and how it responds to the environment to be turned on and off. Because clearly we have thousands of um, genes in a genome and it would make no sense whatsoever to express all those genes simultaneously. Okay? There's, there's constitutive genes that are on most of the time, which is fine, that, that subset for those things that the cell needs all the time. But sometimes the cell needs to respond to something it encounters and turn those genes on for, for that short period of time. Okay? And some genes need to be turned off and then um, turned on. So we've got these different processes for turning genes on and off. Um, so, so this process of gene expression and turning you know, this, this process on and off, it can be regulated at many different points along the process. Um, we're not really going to focus on anything other really than um, transcription initiation, because okay? that's one of the most important um, control points. But it's worth noting that in such a long process that takes the cell, you know, might take the cell, I don't know, depending on the eukaryotic or product, pro prokaryotic, it might take a few minutes to 45 minutes, whatever, to turn a gene on, to actually make a protein from a gene. So it's a long process, lots of things going on, and lots of control points. Okay? So the ones I've listed here um, are transcription initiation, which we've kind of talked about, and we'll elaborate on that. Um, RNA processing, so the, um, the, the splicing out of the introns, the adding the three prime um, poly A tail and the five prime cap, um, and, and you know there's processes involved with that which can regulate this process. Um, the, the stability of the, NMR, of the RNA is important. If the RNA hangs around the cell for longer, then in theory it can be translated more. Okay? There's other things that make that affect the efficiency of of, um, of, of translation, but RNA stability is certainly one of them. Um, so we, we've got protein synthesis, the stages of protein synthesis that can be regulated. And then once we actually get a protein, the, 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 the string that comes out of the, um, the ribosome that needs to fold, it's not necessarily active straight away. Okay? Um, it might need modification to be, become active, such as phosphorylation or acetylation or methylation. There's lots of processes where proteins can be chemically modified after they're made. And it affects their structure and therefore it affects their function. Um, some, some proteins are only functional really when they're in the membrane or in the nucleus or, or whatever part of the cell they're needed. So proteins have to be transported to their site before that protein is active. And then the protein's around for a certain period of time before it's degraded. Um, so I guess these are the processes of um, gene expression. These are the regulatory points along that um, process. We're going to be looking at sort of transcription, um, the control of turning genes on and off. Um, the next slide is those same seven points in a slightly more graphic way. It's not particularly more enlightening, but it's just another way of mentioning these points. So. From the, um, the, the genome, we've got individual genes which are um, transcribed, so we have regulation of transcription initiation. Um, this gives rise to a, um, an RNA which needs to be processed, and we've talked about RNA processing. Um, this gives rise to a mature messenger RNA which um, has a certain um, half-life in the cell, so some of them exist for significant, significantly longer than others. Um, we then have the process of translation to make the protein, which may or may not be active when it's made, so we can get some protein modifications to turn on or turn off or modify the protein activity. And then um, we can get um, transport of proteins to different locations in the cell so that they're functionally active. And then we get degradation of the proteins and the amino acids can be recycled to make another protein. So that's gene expression overall. Um, we're not going to go into um, 
protein modification or protein degradation in these lectures. Um, whoops. Okay. So, so you can clearly appreciate that there are many points where this process can be regulated. And we're going to talk about um, transcription initiation since it's the most widely used point and probably the best understood um, in both bacteria and in eukaryotes. Um, the book says it's the most least costly way to make a gene, to control a gene. Um, I mean, you don't want to expend a lot of energy in making a protein and then degrading it without using it. It's good. So that point of degrading a protein isn't a particularly efficient point of the control um, you know, of this, this procedure I was talking about. Um, you, this can be regulated, but you wouldn't use this late point to regulate gene expression because you've expended all that energy to make a protein and then, you know, um, but there might be some instances where, you know, something's happened in the cell and that triggers that the protein is no longer needed and it's broken down. Okay, so um, the least costly point is to, to control the start of the process, which is um, why it's the least costly. Um, Okay, so if you think of this as a, the, the, the synthetic pathway of gene expression, then transcription is the start. Okay, so um, we've looked at the um, RNA polymerase in E. coli, and um, we've looked at the sigma factor, and we've looked at the process of translation, uh, sorry, transcription. Um, so now we're going to um, sort of look at how it's regulated. So. We have a promoter sequence, which is shown at the bottom here. And in, in, in the most basic way of thinking about it, there's an affinity between the RNA polymerase and the promoter sequence. And it, the affinity determines how strongly the, um, the RNA polymerase can bind to the DNA so it can carry out its process. So if, it, if that promoter happens to be, have, have sequences that can bind strongly, then you'll get relatively efficient um, transcription. If it, it's a weak promoter and it hasn't got particularly good binding sites, then you'll get weak transcription. So at the basic level, there's an affinity between the, the, the promoter and the RNA polymerase. So, um, so promoter sequences allow the RNA polymerase to bind and initiate transcription, and we have variations in the sequence which affect this efficiency. So I've got a little diagram here which is a bit naff, but you can have um, a weak promoter where it it's hasn't got strong affinity, or you, can ha or you can have one that has strong affinity. So this one here, with strong affinity, it binds, it stays there, and it, then it'll assemble all the factors, and then it'll transcribe. Okay? So on, on the basic level, we've got um, these promoters that have an, um, some sort of inherent affinity for the polymerase. Um, but there are other proteins which come into play which are really important in the process, and we call these... Um, generically, we call these transcription factors, and two classes of tra transcription factors are activators, or transcription activators, and repressors, or transcriptional repressors, okay? So these are proteins that bind to DNA, so they're transcription factors, and they can either be activators or repressors, okay? So within the promoter sequence of the gene, it will have motifs, which are these small, you know, um, predictable sequences which can bind these activators and repressors, okay? Just in the same way that the promoter can bind the polymerase, okay? So um, activators and repressors um, proteins confer further levels of regulation by altering transcription um, in response to metabolites. So we'll have a look at two cases here. The first is the um, repressor kind of protein. So if this is our um, promoter sequence here, two binding sites are shown in addition to the promoter that binds the RNA polymerase. So polymerase binds at the promoter, but there's these two other sites that are a part of this promoter sequence. Okay? In this simple example here, um, one of these binding motifs is a binding site for a repressor protein shown here in red. So again, it's that traffic light system, red protein means stop. A green protein will be an activator, and the green will mean go. Okay? So this has got one of these um, repressor proteins here, 
And the repressor protein can function in one of two ways. It can either stop the polymerase from actually binding to the promoter, or when the polymerase is bound, it can stop the polymerase from moving through the promoter. So it's a roadblock. It sits there and either stops binding or stops movement of the polymerase, depending on where it is. Okay? The other class of these transcription factor proteins that we're talking about are the activator proteins. And I've just got a diagram here showing um, the activator binding site, which is also shown here, but we're just discussing the activator site here. And at the activator site, clearly, there's another protein, a different protein, um, which is specific for the gene, which binds to the um, activator site. And it's probably not that clear from this diagram here, but the green protein, which is driving expression, which is turning initiation on, if you like, the binding of the green protein stabilizes or encourages the binding of the RNA polymerase. It doesn't inhibit the binding of the polymerase. It encourages the binding of the polymerase. So there's some protein-protein interactions here which make it more stable somehow or that just um, in encourage it to stay bound to the promoter. Okay? So we've got repressor proteins which block or discourage the RNA polymerase from binding. And we can have activator proteins which can encourage and stabilize RNA polymerase binding to, the, to promoter sequences. Okay? So we're going to look at some, uh, a specific example of regulation of an operon, and then we'll look at um, a, a, an example of a repressor that affects that operon, and then we'll look at an, um, an example of an activator that affects the same operon. Okay? How are we going? Is this kind of making sense? Kind of? I'm happy to backtrack. I know what you're thinking. You think in play school. You're thinking, yeah, yeah. All right. This is right. Okay. Um, okay, so before we look at a, a promoter, um, we need to think of the promoter in, in a cellular context. What that, what that gene is trying to do. Why it's, so what, does it need to be on or off in a certain environment? Okay? So the two broad classes of metabolism that we have. I'm sure you've done this because you've done a subject called metabolism. I've got no idea what they teach you in that, but have you done metabolism? No, I don't know. I don't know what they teach in metabolism, but what I'll tell you about metabolism, metabolism is that it can be broken up into two broad categories. You can have catabolism and anabolism, okay? And the two together make up metabolism. So catabolism is the breaking down of things, and anabolism is the making of things. So your cells obviously have to break some things down and make other things. So the classic sorts of things that cells break down will be things like sugars, all right? so nutrients. So cells have to break down these complex molecules such as sugars and make ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. And then the ATP can be used for heaps of things, all right? anything from DNA synthesis to driving translation to you know, um, lots of things. Okay? It's the energy currency. So um, we can break sugars down, um, e.g. breaking down lactose to make energy. And some of the things we need to make are things that we can't get from the environment. So often amino acids are difficult to get from the environment. We can make a lot of them, but we can't make all of them. Okay? So um, a bacteria can't go to the local chemist and grab Blackmore's you know, vitamin supplement and, and have that. You know, it has to make all of its, enzo all of its amino acids. Um, there's a couple it can't make, and it has to um, import them, but we're not going to talk about that. So, so anabolism is the using up this energy that's made from breaking things down to make the things it needs. Um, such as making amino acids so it can then make proteins so then it can carry out enzymatic reactions. Okay? So we're going to look at um, a gene that's regulated um, to facilitate um, breaking down of sugar, and then we'll talk about another gene that's um, regulated in response to um, making amino acids. Okay? So um, when we think of the control of gene expression, um, basically, we're making enzymes or proteins in the cell so that the cell can carry out various met metabolic pathways. 
and then you know we can either in increase or decrease um, the sorts of nutrients and, and the things we need to make. Um, so effectively, the um, regulation of gene expression is, I'm just reading the slide here, is um, essential for making use of optimal energy available. So some bacteria might be in an environment where there's lots of glucose around. So it's metabolizing glucose happily, but then the bacteria might find itself depleted of glucose, but suddenly lactose is available. Lactose is much rarer in the environment for some of these bacteria, for argument's sake, and therefore it needs to turn on those genes so it can consume the lactose. It doesn't turn those genes on when lactose isn't around because it's a waste of energy. Okay? So some genes are turned on through these activated proteins when lactose is present. All right? um, and likewise, we'll talk about a situ I'll explain a situation where some genes are turned off when something is made. So if you've got an amino acid in a cell, you don't need to make it. So amino acids can actually turn off the expression of genes that are required to make them. All right? So I'll explain, I'll talk about that in a little while as well. So as I said earlier, we're going to look at um, a gene, turning on genes that are required for uh, metabolizing lactose. Okay? So breaking down lactose to make um, energy. So, as a refresher on what lactose is, um, as you can see here, um, lactose is a disaccharide, so we have two sugars here joined together by this bond. Um, this bond is called a beta-glycosidic bond. Okay? So beta because it's in the beta configuration rather than the alpha configuration. And it's a glycosidic bond that joins these two sugars together. Um, these two sugars are both hexose sugars, if you, do the, if you count the um, carbons, you go one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you've got two hexose sugars. Um, galactose is the one on the left, and glucose is the one on the right. So I know um, students, you know, sort of go, um, was it, is it um, down, up, down for one, and then down, up, up for the others. I know there's, you've got these little ac acronyms for remembering which sugar is which. I can never remember which is which. But um, here we have um, galactose and glucose, um, two monosaccharides joined together by a beta glycosidic bond, and this disaccharide is, is called lactose. Okay? Um, so, so the enzyme that the cell has to help it digest lactose is an enzyme called beta galactosidase. And I'm sure you're all familiar with beta-galactosidase from the labs because it's used in molecular biology for various procedures, and I'll, I might mention that a bit later. But in this context, the bacteria wants to digest lactose, and to digest lactose, it has to turn on a gene called beta-galactosidase, which is absent in the cell. So the presence of lactose has to trigger the expression, the turning on, on of the gene, to make beta-galactosidase. And then beta-galactosidase will cleave this um, beta-glycosidic bond that joins these two um, sugars together to make available to the cell galactose and glucose. Okay? And glucose is, uh, is probably the easiest sugar the cell has to digest. It feeds straight into um, glycolysis and produces energy straight away. So, <clears throat> So let's have a look at the, um, the promoter of the um, operon that, is, that contains the beta-galactosidase gene. So remember, um, an operon is a collection of, for argument's sake, three um, gene sequences attached to one promoter. So this is the one promoter that's going to um, regulate a bunch of genes, including beta-galactosidase. Okay? And as we've seen in the earlier diagram, this promoter is shown to have a repressor binding site and an activator binding site. Okay? Now, I've just overlaid here the actual sequence that we're looking at. So this is the, the actual sequence taken from a 1960s publication. All right? So I just dug around and found... Because I was just curious how accurate the textbook is relative to the actual li literature it's quoting. So I, I thought it would be a bit of fun to, to have a look. 
And um, so what we have here is the promoter sequence of the gene. Um, we have a, um, a, an activator site here, and somewhere around here is the repressor site. So there's just these motifs, these, these strings of nucleotides that constitute an, an activator binding site or a repressor binding site. Okay? Um, and then somewhere in between here is, the, is where the, the polymerase would, would bind. Okay? So the LAC operon, as, as, as an example, it's a weak promoter. So remember I was saying that the, the polymerases have, don't have a strong affinity for the promoter and it sort of just sort of limply binds and it will probably be bounced off before, rather than um, transcribe. So it, it's a fairly weak promoter. It can be switched completely off. It can be turned, put into the off state and it can be switched on, into the on state. Okay, so we've got, remember those green proteins and red proteins? One can turn it on and one can turn it off. Um, when it's turned on, it becomes one of the most highly expressed genes in the bacterial genome. So it's going from a weak promoter to being really efficient um, at, at expressing, uh, at transcribing um, the gene. So um, we'll look at the, the process and, and the proteins that turn it on and turn it off. So this is the LAC operon now, not as a, a generic one, as I was showing you here. This, this is the, um, the generic view that we were using just to talk about the, the concept of activators and repressors. Now we're going to look at the actual promoter, which is this one here, but in the textbook. So this is the, the LAC operon um, in the textbook. So we've got a bit of nomenclature here, which is not necessarily intuitive what everything is. Um, we've got three um, gene sequences here. So we've got LAC-Z, LAC-Z if you're English. I don't know what you Australians say. Um, we've got LAC-Y and LAC-A. So these three sequences here, LAC-Z, LAC-Y, LAC-A, are the, um, the, the, the sequences that will be translated once it's transcribed into, 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 into three proteins. And then in the promoter region here, um, around here, you've got a site called the LAC-O. O stands for operator. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the operator site. And then we've got the LAC L here, okay? So, um, and this is, an, th this is actually another gene. It's got its own promoter, its own sequence, and then um, you've got another um, promoter here for these three genes here. So, effectively, we have, um, we have promoter for the LAC genes, and we have a promoter here for this other um, protein that I'll talk about. Um, and the LAC operon is actually these ones here because this promoter controls these genes, so that's the operon. This is a separate gene, but it's, it's really important as well because this codes for a protein that is going to regulate these ones here. Okay, so, so I'll talk about the, um, the, the, this protein um, as well, or, or the product of that, the product of that gene. So, so effectively, from the LAC operon, um, three proteins are made from the one polycystronic messenger RNA that will be um, transcribed. And those three proteins are shown here. Um, I'll just try to sort of link the, the, the proteins to the, the gene sequences. And what are these three proteins? Um, these three proteins are the, the, the protein that cleaves that beta-glycosidic bond in the lactose. So we have a, have a protein called beta-galactosidase which is encoded by the LAC-Z gene. Okay? We also have another protein which is co-regulated, if you like, or expressed at the same time because it's on the same operon, it's on the same messenger RNA, so it's going to be translated as well. So we have another protein that's made at the same time that beta-galactosidose is, is made. And this is called LAC, the LAC-Y gene codes for galactosidase permease. Okay? So this is a protein that needs to locate itself in the membrane to work. Okay? And then we've got another um, protein, um, thiogalactoside um, transacetylase. So this is the LAC-A protein, and this is the protein we don't talk about much. This is the, um, the, the, the um, lesser um, cared about protein of the three, simply because it plays a lesser role in uh, metabolizing um, lactose. So, um, these are the two we're going to focus on, the LAC-Z 
Z and the LAC Y um, products, which are beta-galactosidase and the galactoside permease. And how do these three proteins function in the cell? Well, I've, I've got a little... Um, oh, let me give you the definitions first, sorry. So beta-galactosidase, it, I've already said this, it, ca it catalyzes lactose into glucose and galactose, uh, which can then be metabolized to make ATP. The galactosidase permease it inserts into the plasma membrane, and it's um, a transport protein that brings lactose into the cell. And the thiogalactase um, effectively breaks down toxic galactosides, um, which may enter the cell through the system as well. Okay? So these three proteins function in the cell um, to metabolize um, lactose. So what I'm showing here is the cell membrane at the top here, so the plasma membrane, and um, in here is a protein that's bringing lactose into the cell. So this bacteria has no lactose. It suddenly comes into contact to lactose in the environment, and it brings some lactose into the cell. And it's the LACY gene that codes for the galactosidase permease that brings lactose into the cell. Okay? Once lactose is into the cell, it's going to um, somehow trigger genes to be turned on so that those proteins can break down the lactose. So effectively, um, the, the LACZ gene, which is going to be turned on, is going to break this um, glycosidic bond here and produce um, galactose and glucose. And we have another protein here which um, has something to do with removing toxic lactosides that are brought in. Okay. Now, if you look at this diagram carefully, we've got lactose here, and we've, we've talked about lactose. We've got galactose and glucose, and we've talked about those. But you've got this other thing here called allolactose. All right? Now, there's a faint arrow here indicating small amounts of lactose is converted into allolactose, where most of it, by the dark arrow, most of lactose is going to be degraded or cleaved um, into the two sugars. But why is allolactose being produced? It's the allolactose that is actually the molecule that regulates the gene. Okay? So I'll say that again. It's the allolactose is the molecule that is going to be regulating the, um, if you like, the, um, the repressor protein. Okay? So allolactose is involved in um, turning the gene um, on or off, and it works through a repressor protein, and I'll describe that. So, so any lactose that comes into the cell, a small amount of it will be converted to allolactose. So allolactose tells you that lactose is present. Okay? You can't have allolactose if lactose wasn't there, because it's, it's, a, it's just a, an isomerization of this molecule. Okay? It's, it's, there's, um, it's just an, an, an isomerization of that molecule. So the presence of allolactose means that lactose is present. We now have to consider that we're kind of 1960s scientists trying to work out how do you actually study this problem. Okay? I want to know how are genes regulated, what assay am I going to use, and how am I going to actually measure the, 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 the fact that the gene is on or the fact that the gene is off. Okay? So um, I'm going to sort of describe to you the work by two scientists, two French scientists, um, um, Jacob and Minot, and I'll put a slide for them later. So, so to study the process, you need to be able to turn something on or off in a controlled way. Okay? Now, we know that allolactose turns it on, because I've told you that, but um, as lactose gets broken down, allolactose will become more scarce, because allolactose is a product of lactose. So it's hard to study something when the thing you're using to turn it on is being degraded by the cell. Okay? So they needed to have a way of turning the genes on. So, so normally, allolactose is the inducer for the lact, for, for this, the, the, the lact operon. Um, but as the lactose is broken down, then less of, it, less of the lactose is converted into um, the allolactose. So effectively, 
these guys came up with a, an analogue of allolactose, and that analogue is called IPTG. Well, it's not called IPTG, it's called isopropyl thiogalactopyranoside, but I'm going to call it IPTG. Okay? As a lecturer, I always feel obliged to try and pronounce these long words just to tell you that I, I probably know what they are. But um, anyway, so uh, IPTG is a analog of allolactose, and the important thing is that IPTG cannot be metabolized by the cell. Okay? It doesn't get broken down. It's independent of the lactose molecule, and therefore it's independent of the allolactose molecule. So I can add IPTG to the cell to turn on that promoter through a mechanism we'll describe. Okay? So we have a non-metabolizable inducer. So in my experiments, I'm not going to use allolactose as the inducer. I'm going to use IPTG as the inducer because it's not going to be metabolized, and I can control the amount of that compound in the cell. The other thing is, well, I need to look at the amount of, um, of lactose present in the cell, and I don't have an assay for lactose. Okay? Lactose doesn't fluoresce a certain color. Lactose can't be detected in a spectrophotometer. I've got no way of detecting lactose, particularly as a 1960s scientist. So again, they chose another analog, if you like, a molecule that mimics um, lactose. So this is the, uh, the substrate for the beta-galactosidase. So rather than beta-galactosidase breaking the beta-glycosidic bond between galactose and glucose, what um, the beta-galactosidase is going to do, it's going to cleave this bond instead. Okay? It has a strong affinity for this bond. It can cleave this bond. And when it cleaves that bond, it releases a compound which is colored and that can be detected in a spectrophotometer. So, you've got, so now you've got the, the gubbins of an assay. You can turn on the, the system with um, something that's not going to be degraded by the cell, and you can produce a product from the protein you want to, and the gene that you're assaying that will give you a color. So you've got a system now where you can start to study the um, response of the cell to um, effectively a sugar and see how it turns on genes to break down that sugar. So you can start to understand the process of gene regulation. So again, you've got to think back to these experiments in the 1960s. People didn't understand anything about gene regulation. They didn't know what it was that turned on a gene. They didn't know how it functioned. So these guys made incredible inroads using some fairly simple chemistry and experiments, very clever, simple um, um, approaches. So, so, so what you see in this experiment is that um, the bacterial colonies, um, once you add the, the IPTG, to turn on the beta-galactosidase gene, the beta-galactosidase then cleaves this bond here, and this compound here turns blue. So the colony turns blue. So when you add IPTG to um, these bacteria that can, um, you know, you, you effectually, um, once the LACZ gene is turned on, they, they turn blue because this product here fluoresces blue. Okay? So they, they, they devised this experiment to measure um, the um, expression of the gene. Now, it's a bit confusing for you guys because as a 1990s era molecular biologist, or a, I don't know what the, we've had the noughties, what, what are we in now? What's 2017? The teenies. You, you teenies molecular biologists think about these products in a very different way. You think about them, I assume, um, as tools to do cloning experiments. So if you think back to your laboratory, you've got a plasmid that's got um, the beta-galactosidase gene in it, and it's got the beta-galactosidase promoter there, and what you do, you cut the beta-galactosidase exon, and you break the beta-galactosidase so that it can't turn IPTG blue. So when you've got a white colony, there's a good chance that you've got a gene in there because you've knocked out your beta-galactosidase sequence. So you use this in, in a completely different context than what I'm talking about. You use it in molecular biology for cloning. All right? And I think you've done an experiment. I don't know what you... can't remember what you're doing in the labs. Did you use IPTG at any point in the labs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
Um, so you've got a bit of a background into these things, but we're looking at now how they were used in the first instance by Jacob and Minot, who used them to study the actual protein that, that digests lactose, which is the beta-galactosidase protein. So, so from the work of Jacob and Minot, um, we, we, we know how the lac operon functions. And even though we're not going to go into these experiments in much detail. The textbook does, and I think it's really interesting if you read through the, the, the sections in the textbook, but um, it's kind of beyond the scope of what I'm talking about. Um, but they, they, they won a Nobel Prize for their work, so I think whenever someone wins a Nobel Prize, it's worth reading about if you want to understand good approaches to solving problems in science. Okay, so, um, so, so, so they, they established that the operon consists of two main elements. Um, one was um, a protein repressor, which the textbook's full of now, and we were talking about these repressor proteins, these red proteins in the, in the diagram. And the protein they, they, they discovered was the LAC repressor, okay? And it's encoded by the LAC-L gene. So remember when we ha I've probably got a diagram coming up. Yeah. So remember when I showed you this um, diagram here, this is the LAC operon, one promoter with the three genes, and then this is other gene just upstream. Okay? This is the LAC-L gene, all right? and it codes for this protein here. So, so they, they, they discovered that um, to regulate the LAC operon, a protein repressor, which is encoded by the LAC-L gene, is, is, is made. All right? And that's, I think... Don't quote me on this. I think that's constitutively expressed. It's just there. The lack, that, that, that repressor is present in the cell, okay? And therefore, the genes are turned off, okay? It's there all the time, okay? So we've got this LAC-L gene making the, the, that protein repressor. Now, the protein re repressor is a transcription factor which is going to bind to, to DNA. So where does it bind to DNA? It binds in the actual LAC operon at a site called the LAC-O site, so um, there's, there's a binding site in the promoter where the repressor binds, okay? And, um, and in, the act, in the absence of any lactose, in the absence of any sugar, the lac genes are turned off because this um, lac repressor is bound at the lac operator site. So in the absence of glucose, this is on. It produces a protein which binds to this site here, and this is the repressor binding site, and that turns off the, the polymerase from reading these genes here. Okay? So in the absence of lactose, the lac repressor binds to the operator sequence. So what J Jacob and Minot did, they did mutational studies. They got this sequence of DNA there, and they mutated it, and they made lots and lots of variations of this gene sequence. They then put that gene sequence into bacteria, and then looked at the response of these genes to lactose. And they identified mutants that were on all the time. They couldn't turn some of their mutants off. And what they worked out was they were on all the time because they'd mutated the operator site, so the repressor couldn't bind. So it was on all the time. They also mutated the LAC-L or the promoter. They, 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 they created mutants here as well, so that the protein wasn't made. So that they, they identified two really important regions, sites of mutations, that t led to the constitutive on. This gene was being expressed all the time. And it was the first demonstration in science, effectively, of a protein that was produced whose function was to bind to DNA. People didn't think about proteins as things that bound to DNA to regulate things. They didn't know how genes were regulated, probably thought it was proteins, but no one had shown it explicitly. So these guys showed that through mutational studies, they knew a sequence here was important. If you mutate that sequence, the gene's on. And they knew this sequence here was important. If you mutate that sequence, that gene's on. And they, 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 they put all that genetics together to, to suggest that this makes a protein that binds here to repress that gene. Okay, and it was the first studied example of a tr transcription factor that regulates a gene, hence the Nobel Prize. All right, so, um, so what effectively happens is that when lactose is present in the cell, 
lactose is going to bind to the lac repressor <coughs> protein. Okay? And when the allolactose binds to the lactose repressor protein, it changes the structure conformation. If you look here at the top, it's the, the lac repressor is made up of four subunits, and it's showing these two subunits here as being in this kind of orientation. And when the, lac, when the allolactose binds to the lac repressor, they flip out to a different orientation. So it changes the 3D structure of the protein. And I've been saying to you that structure and function are the same thing. When you change the structure of a protein, you change its function. So when you change the structure of this protein through binding to allolactose, it doesn't now function anymore to recognize that DNA sequence, and therefore it can't block the polymerase. And when you can't block the polymerase, the polymerase can then, through its inherent affinity for the polymerase, can then express, can transcribe those genes. All right, and then we get those three product, protein products being made. And then this can break down the lactose, this can import the lactose, and this can do the other stuff that we don't talk about. Let's take a break, five, ten minutes, and I'll ask you after the break whether you want me to go over some of that again, or we can just plough on. Okay, well, um, I shall continue in the interest of time. Um, so I've just been dis describing to you um, some of the work of Jacob and Minot, and um, as I was saying, the, the, the thing that Jacob and Minot did, they came up with a... Um, a non-metabolizable version of allolactose to um, turn on the, um, the gene. So the IPTG was effectively acting to bind to the lac repressor in place of the allolactose. Okay? And the ITPG, um, they were able to knock out um, that system and and also, they came up with a, um, a, a synthetic substrate that when it was cleaved by the beta-galactosidase, it gave um, this strong color that could be um, detected on, uh, in the colonies. And through mutational studies and these tools they had, they, did, they, they worked out, they, they've, they identified a bunch of mutations. Um, some were constitutively on, some were constitutively off, and through mutational analysis, they were able to um, establish that the LAC-L gene um, coded for the LAC repressor, which bound to the operator that was within the LAC operon. So we had a, 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 a transcription factor here, a, a protein, that bound to the DNA sequence to inhibit the polymerase from reading, um, transcribing these genes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 so the the question is, is well, it, it's a multi-layered question. I think it's it's the order of expression, and also the fact that. Um, so, so, so I don't think the actual order in the gene matters too much because the, the well, maybe it does, but the, the, the messenger RNA will contain all those three sequences and the messenger RNA will have three independent ribosome binding sites. So each of those sequences from the messenger RNA can be bound by a ribosome and then that um, sequence can be translated into a protein. Okay, so I, I, I would think of them generically. I don't know if this is the right way to think about it, but I would think of them generically as being co-expressed. So I would think that you know, if lac Z is present in the cell, then lac Y is present in the cell at about the same time. Okay, the there is a conundrum about um, lactose regulating the gene, and I'll explain that to you. I think it's coming up very, very soon. Um, so let me try and... Um, but I'll just say that um, if you think about how... Let me just go back a few slides. If you go back to all the way to here. So the, the, the conundrum is that 
if you don't express LACY, then you don't get lactose in the cell. And if you don't get lactose in the cell, you can't turn the gene on. Okay, so that's, I think that's what you're probably suggesting. So I'll explain how a little bit of this is made, a little bit of this system is turned on. So effectively, um, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, Okay, so let's have a look at this LAC repressor in a bit of detail. Um, again, so we'll have a quick look at its structure and, and how it functions. So, so the LAC repressor is a tetramer, um, and effectively it's made up of two dimers. I don't know why they make that distinction, but that's what they say. So it's two um, homo dimers coming together to make a homo tetramer. So it's the same, four copies of the same protein making up this um, this tetramer protein. And, um, and and the, the, there's actually two binding sites for this one protein, okay, and I'll explain that. Um, and effectively, there's a domain within the transcription factor which is called a helix turn helix motive. So, um, it just means you've got a helical part of the protein, and then you've got a floppy turn part of the protein, and you've got another helix part of the protein. Okay, so you've got these two alpha helices that are oriented in a certain way within the protein, and then you've got a third helix, an adjacent helix, which is referred to as a hinge. And effectively, this helix turn helix motif um, is the region of the protein that binds to the DNA. So this is probably too much information for you, but w when you start to get more involved with the transcription factors, there are families of transcription factors. So there are ones that have helix turn helix motifs, there are leucine zipper motifs, there are zinc factor motifs. There are these different domains that people have identified that this part of a protein binds to the DNA, and lots of proteins share that domain. So a lot of transcription factors have one of those three domains in them. Okay? Um, but this particular domain that we're talking about in the lac repressor is the helix turn helix motif. And it's the helix turn helix that binds to the, the DNA. And um, the inducer, the allolactose or the IPTG, depending on how you think about it, um, the binding of the inducer to this lac repressor causes a disordering of this hinge region and it causes um, weaker, you know, it, it means that it can't bind to the DNA. So this is the, our typical B-form DNA with our double helix with one strand going in the opposite direction to the other strand and here's the bases in between. Um, one thing you probably know about DNA is that when you follow the two grooves around the helix, you've got a major groove and a minor groove. So one groove is bigger than the other groove. Okay? So shown here is the major groove, which is the wide one, and then the minor groove here. And if you were to go up the molecule, those two grooves just keep spinning around and around and around. Okay? And it's within the major groove here that the helix turn helix motif binds. So you can see that the structure of this motif here um, is like a lock and key kind of thing here with the major groove here. And within the major groove, it's the sides of these bases that have a particular structure that interacts with, you know, the amino acid residues, so it can recognize the bases, the, 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 the DNA sequence within the major group, and it can bind specifically to that region of the DNA. Okay? So it's quite a fascinating, you know, when you look at these things in more and more detail, it gets more and more complicated, but it also gets more and more interesting. Okay? So here's the turn helix uh, sorry, the helix turn helix motif, and here's the hinge region that interacts with the, um, the inducer. So in the absence of the inducer, this is um, in this orientation, and then when the inducer binds, it changes the structure of that helix turn helix motif and loosens it up, and it just doesn't bind and recognize that DNA sequence anymore, and therefore it doesn't block the, the RNA polymerase reading through and transcribing that gene. Okay? So... Again, this is, this is just showing one of those helix 
turn helix motives within the protein. Now, the, the repressor has got four copies of the protein, therefore it's got four of those helix turn helix motives. So here's, here's one of those motives here, another one, another one, and another one. So the binding site for the LAC repressor is this operator, and you can break down the operator into smaller subsections. But what effectively it does, it causes the DNA to actually fold out. So the binding here and the binding here sort of pulls the DNA together and causes it to, to twirl up a little bit. So you get this, this kink in the DNA here, and then when the polymerase comes in to bind to the promoter, it just can't. Or if it can bind, it just can't read through it. Okay? So it's a very physical block to the passage of the RNA polymerase. So this is a repressor protein, and it binds to a particular motive in the promoter that blocks the RNA polymerase from binding and um, transcribing those genes. And like I said here, here's the other gene that we sort of mentioned, the LAC-L gene, which actually codes for the LAC repressor. And this gene is pretty much on most of the time, so this protein is present most of the time, so therefore the protein is um, switched on and off by the presence and absence of the allolactose. It's not, but so, so, so this one here, we're not, this is constitutive, we don't, we're not looking at the, exp the regulation of the expression of this one, but we're looking at this protein, which is always present in the cell, and it's regulated by the inducer, okay? Um, in the absence of the inducer, it binds to the promoter. So when no lactose is present, you don't make the genes to break down lactose. When lactose is present, you have a bit of allolactose, therefore this breaks up, it leaves, and then you can make the genes to break down the sugar. Again, a bit more detail showing the sheer size of this protein relative to the DNA and showing the helix loop helix of the one, two, three, four um, subunits um, binding strongly to these operator units here within um, the, the promoter. So getting back to the question we had earlier, how do we actually um, turn on gene expression if you can't get the lactose into the cell, then th there, has to, there has to be a very low basal level of transcription even in the absence of, um, of lactose. So I don't know whether we just think of, about it as, as a leaky um, um, gene um, pr promoter, um, maybe when the DNA is first made, first copied, there is no repressor present, you know, as you get, you know, so there maybe there's a small window of opportunity to make a couple of copies, a couple of molecules of the, um, the, of the operon, um, the products of the operon before the lac repressor um, locks it closed. So um, there's a small amount of expression has to occur at some point in the cell to, to make the, um, the LAC-Y protein, which is the um, permease that brings the lactose into the cell. But that's in place, and just think of it as being in place so that when lactose is present, it can get into the cell. So a few molecules of galactosidase permease enable lactose to enter the cell. Um, allolactose binds to specific sites in the LAC repressor protein, and in the presence of the allolactose inducer, the, um, the fold increase in expression of beta-galactosidase is about 10,000 fold increase. So it goes from effectively off to one of the most highly expressed genes in, 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 the, um, in, in the bacteria um, for that period of time. So it's very effective at turning genes on. So we've been discussing a repressor protein I've told you earlier in the lecture that we have activator proteins as well. So the question is, does, does um, the LAC operon have an activator protein? And the answer is, well, yes, it does. Um, so, so let's have a quick look at this protein and look at how it functions. Okay? So whilst we've been discussing the metabolism of lactose, we, um, we've been, I don't know if we've, Maybe making any assumptions actually, but um, the assumption is that there's no glucose present. 
Okay, so here's a cell, there's no glucose, therefore it's not metabolizing glucose, it's not, hasn't got this energy, it needs energy, the lactose comes in, turns on. Okay, when um, lactose, well, so, so glucose is said to be a preferred substrate to lactose, okay, um, because it's easier to break down glucose through glycolysis and it's, it's easy to make ATP from glucose. So bacteria prefer to grow on glucose. If you give it two sugars in solution and you get it to grow, you'll notice that it's growing, growing on the glucose and it's ignoring the lactose. It's got a preferred substrate, it's glucose, okay? Um, so effectively, somehow glucose is causing the lac operon to be off, okay? Or it's, 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 you know, and in the absence of glucose, the lac operon is more effective and it's on, more, more effectively on. So how does glucose affect the lac operon? You're going to hate me. Um, it's not glucose directly that affects the lac operon. It's another molecule that mirrors glucose that affects the lac operon. And the other molecule that mirrors glucose is um, cyclic AMP, so C-A-M-P. It's, um, it's your bog standard nucleotide, you know, you've got your um, ATP and you've got your you know, AMP. Well, this is um, a cyclic AMP, meaning that the phosphate that's attached is attached twice and forms this like, cyclic bit on the molecule, so it's called cyclic AMP. Um, it's an important signaling molecule for lots of reasons, not only the fact that it's involved in regulating the lac operon, so it's a common molecule that you'll come across in some subjects. Um, so when glucose levels are low, we have high levels of cyclic AMP, okay? And when glucose levels are high, we have low levels of cyclic AMP. It's like a seesaw, okay? If glucose is high, cyclic AMP is low. If glucose is low, cyclic AMP is high, okay? So, so cy cyclic AMP is the actual molecule that causes the activator protein to come into effect. So we had the red repressor and we've got those green activators and we're now we're talking about one of those green activators and then the actual protein we're talking about is the cyclic AMP receptor protein which is the CRP but if you read a different textbook they'll call the same protein the catabolite activator protein same thing okay so there's two terms depending on which book you're reading that refer to the same protein so this is the effector protein the activator for the lac operon that binds to cyclic AMP. All right. Um, so um, I've put together this diagram here to try and represent how the activator affects um, gene expression. So, so when glucose is absent, which is what we've been discussing effectively, we haven't mentioned glucose, we've just assumed it's, it's not there. So when glucose is absent, the, the levels of cyclic AMP are high because it's the opposite, okay? So we've been discussing the lac operon and cyclic AMP levels have been high in um, Jacob and Minot's experiments, okay? And um, so what effectively, we have high levels of this molecule cyclic AMP, which I've shown here in orange, and we have this other molecule that we haven't yet discussed. And um, when levels of glucose are absent, the cyclic AMP binds to the repressor molecule. I mean, sorry, the activator molecule. And the activator molecule here encourage the binding or facilitate the binding of the RNA polymerase. So that when you relieve the repression, you get very effective um, expression of the, the genes because this activator protein is turning the promoter into a very effective promoter. Because remember I said a lot of promoters don't have strong affinity for the polymerase. And I also said that the lack Operon has low, weak binding of the polymerase. And it's the activator protein that turns the promoter into strong binding to, of the RNA polymerase. So in the absence of glucose, we have this cyclic AMP molecule in high levels, and it's able then to bind to this activator protein. There's a motive in the LAC operon that is recognized by the DNA binding element of this protein, and therefore the activator protein will stabilize 
or tether, or I don't know how you want to think about it, but it will make the polymerase bind strongly to the promoter. Okay? So that's in the um, absence of glucose, which were the jo Jacob and Minow experiments. When, you put gluco when glucose is present, the bacteria doesn't metabolize the lactose. So when glucose is present, oh sorry, that's just showing that the activator encourages the binding of the polymerase, and then when lactose is present, you relieve the repressor and you express the gene. Okay, so it's the activator that's making the promoter really strong. All right, and but when you've got glucose present, you have very weak um, binding. So. Um, so when glucose is present, the cyclic AMP levels are low, and this protein is inactive. So even um, when you've got, so, so you've got the repression. So even in the presence of, of lactose, you can relieve the repression, but you've got such a weak promoter that you don't get really high expression. Okay. So if you've got a, a, a case of the two sugars being present, then you've still got a really weak induction of the lactose genes and therefore the bacteria ends up metabolizing the glucose genes and that's how the, de the decisions made I mean you know bacteria don't have brains and go oh I like the taste of glucose more than lactose I'm going to metabolize that there's just a switch in the, in the metabolism that makes the um, lactose um, metabolism poor and um, that's because the presence of glucose has removed um, the the cyclic AMP and therefore the activator is not um, active and therefore the expression of the gene because it's a weak affinity here you get very weak expression so effectively you only get um, small amounts of, of gene expression and therefore you only get low amounts of the lactose being used and glucose is used preferentially okay so um, so that process that I've described to you is called catabolite repression, okay? Because you've got the glucose repressing the um, expression of the LAC genes, and that's called catabolite repression. Alternatively, you can think about it as a positive regulation because, you know, you, you, you're getting activation um, of things by the cyclic AMP. So people describe it heads or tails. They describe it from different points of view, but it's the same thing. Um, so this is catabolite repression. If you go back to the names of the protein, which I mentioned a long time ago, um, so catabolite activated protein. So that's part of the catabolite repression system we were talking about, or it's just the cyclic AMP receptor protein. It's the same protein that is the activator. All right. Um, so when glucose is depleted, cyclic AMP levels increase, and therefore this protein is activated and it stimulates transcription, which is what I've described to you. Okay, so gluc um, lactose metabolism is a part of catabolism. It's breaking down of a molecule to produce energy. And remember I said metabolism is made up of catabolism and anabolism. So now we're going to look at a gene very quickly, that responds in, in making things in the cell. All right? So the absence of the thing is going to turn the gene on because it wants to make it. And the presence of the thing will turn the gene off because it doesn't need to make it. It's the opposite situation now. Okay? So we had the inducer which was saying, something's present, turn the gene on. But when you're making things, if it's present, you don't want to make more, so the presence of the thing turns the genes off. It's the opposite situation. So we have a repressor, as you'd imagine, but we just have a different logic. So we're looking at, there's a bunch of genes we could look at. The book talks a little bit about the trip operon. So the trip operon is a group of genes that when you turn on these genes and you produce these proteins, you have a me metabolic pathway in place that will make tryptophan. All right? So these are the genes required to make tryptophan. So this is the amino acid that has to be made. And um, so, so the amino acid operon is repressed when the amino acid is present. Because you don't need to make it if it's present. Okay? Um, so, um, and when more of the amino acid is needed, then the operon is, becomes active. 
the genes are turned on. Okay? So how does tryptophan affect the repressor protein for the tryptophan operon? That's the question. So the tryptophan repressor protein in this case is not a tetramer, it's a homodimer. Okay? So it's, it's just um, two copies of the same protein coming together to make this larger structure, which is a heterodimer. And the tryptophan acts as a small molecule effector in the same way that allolactose is a small molecule effector and affects the function of the trip repressor. And the presence of tryptophan permits the repressor to bind. Okay, remember the presence of tryptophan says, I don't need to make more tryptophan, therefore I don't need the genes on. Okay? So the presence of tryptophan um, permits the repressor to function. All right? And therefore the, the repressor will inhibit expression of the tryptophan operon because we don't need to make tryptophan. Okay? So here's a little diagram showing the trip operon. So um, here is the trip repressor, the, that dimer I was talking about, and here is the operon that represents the trip operon. So again, we've got one promoter in an operon with a bunch of um, sequences which code for different genes. And all of these genes are turned on simultaneously from one promoter because all of these genes or all of these proteins are needed to make a metabolic pathway. So it makes sense to co-regulate them, to turn them all on at the same time. And the way bacteria co-regulates things is through operons to turn on trip E, trip D, trip C, trip B, and trip A simultaneously. And there's an operator here, which is the binding site of the repressor. So it's very similar to the, the LAC operon. Um, the main difference is the presence of the effector molecule, which is tryptophan, encourages the binding of the repressor. Okay? So presence of tryptophan turns off the genes. Okay? So it's fairly straightforward when you think about it, and if you think about it as catabolism and anabolism and whether the gene should be on or should be off in response to the effector protein, then you can almost rationalize that you know, um, the repressor will be active in the presence of tryptophan because it needs to turn the genes off. Or the repressor will be inactive in the presence of the allolactose because it needs to turn the genes on. Okay? So you, you can rationalize, and it makes complete sense to rationalize it if you're trying to think it through. All right. Um, so, like I was saying, the, the tryptophan operator um, site, which is this O site here, this operator site, it um, overlaps with the promoter, which binds the RNA polymerase, and the binding of the repressor blocks the polymerase. In this way, the, the, you have negative regulation of the trip operon. And like I was also saying, is that the, um, the, 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 the negative regulation of the LAC operon, with, with the LAC repressor binding, um, the LAC repressor binds in the absence of the effector, and the trip repressor binds in the presence of the effector. The effector being allolactose for the um, LAC repressor, and the effector being tryptophan for the trip repressor. Okay? And that reflects their different roles in anabolism and catabolism. Um, I'm not going to talk about this, and I, I feel bad flagging something and then not going off to talk about it, but I think it's too much detail. But there is another mechanism that is effective in regulating the tryptophan operon. And you know, we've, I showed you that diagram of, um, of gene expression that had different, so seven different regulatory points where you can, re you can regulate it at the start of transcription and you can regulate it further on down the track. Well, attenuation happens a little bit later on um, after transcription is happening, and it, it, it's, it's a mechanism that occurs um, through secondary structure in the messenger RNA. Um, again, the textbook goes into the detail, um, but I'm not going to go into the detail here. But effectively, um, there are... Residue, well, I won't go into the detail because it, I'll just con confuse you and myself and it's too much detail which you don't need to know. But um, there's a process called attenuation 
which is um, hairpin loops in the messenger RNA, and these hairpin loops can act to stop translation, and then if you remove the hairpin loops, you can allow that messenger RNA to be translated. So um, there's, there's a, the cell has a mechanism to regulate that. And I'm just going to finish off um, to talk about um, another way of regulating a bunch of genes. So we've, I've been describing to you operons, which are bunches of genes that need to be co-expressed at the same time. Okay? Sometimes, even in bacteria, you've got genes that are distributed throughout the genome that need to be regulated at the same time. Okay? So we'll look at one of the um, mechanisms that was first, you know, that's well understood, um, and this is the... Um, the, the regulation of a, of, a, of a response called the SOS response. So it's like a, I'm in distress, I need to turn these genes on kind of response. Okay? So, so the, the SOS response. So this leads to the, the transcription of uh, many genes that are scattered around the, the bacteria genome and that aren't a part of one operon. It's just independent genes with independent promoters. Okay? But Similar, obviously, they've got similar promoters because they're similarly regulated. So the SOS response um, leads to the coordinated transcription of a bunch of genes. Um, and um, typically, genes that have a similar function are co-regulated. Um, and there's a single transcription factor um, which is able to regulate these genes. And um, in this case, the SOS response the cell is responding to DNA damage. So um, if you get DNA damage um, across the genome, then there's a mechanism there to turn on DNA repair genes. Um, so this is an interesting example of um, how you know, the, 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 there's a genetic program to respond to DNA damage. So um, when we have extensive breakage or mutations in the chromosome, this is going to trigger the expression of the repair genes, and this is the, the, the SOS response. Now, what is the SOS response? There are two key proteins involved in the SOS response, and unfortunately, their names don't tie in nicely to understanding the process. We've got the REC A gene and the LEX A. Um, protein, the REC A protein and the, and the LEX A protein. So I'll describe these two proteins and how they function together to, um, to respond to, to damaged DNA and to turn genes on. So um, one of those proteins is a repressor. The LEX A protein is the repressor protein. And it typically for a repressor, it binds to um, a region of the promoter to stop expression of, of, the, of those genes. So the LEX repressor um, inhibits transcription by binding near the promoter site. So to turn on these genes, we effectively have to remove the LEX A repressor in the same way that um, you know, we, we were um, altering the binding of the LAC repressor and the tryptophan repressor. There has to be a mechanism to remove the LEX A repressor. Okay? Now, the, the removal or dissociation of the LEX A isn't in response to a small molecule, okay? Because what we're responding to here is DNA damage, okay? So the, the LEX A protein is actually removed through self-cleavage. So it's, it's a protein that can auto-catalyze its breakdown and can cleave itself, okay? And the way it works is, um, part of the mechanism is that the LEX A repressor um, protein it's bound to the promoter here blocking transcription. Now, it comes off and is replaced by another one. So you've got this turnover of this protein loosely binding to the promoter. Okay? So it's, it's dissociating, attaching, dissociating. There's lots of them coming in. And as a collective, they turn off the genes because there's, typically there's always one bound and it's turning off that gene. All right? So you've got the Lex A repressor, which is bound at the promoter, but Actually, you've got a family, you know, a group of them alternating. Okay? And it's important because when the protein is away from the promoter is when it can be broken down. So slowly as you break it, break it down, there's less of them to go back and turn on the, the repression. So the question is, how do you break down this repressor? 
protein in response to DNA damage. So at the top here, I think, I can't remember my animation, but I think this is representing normal DNA that's not damaged. And when DNA is damaged, okay, first I'm showing the fact that the, the Lex A repressor is um, binding on and off from the repressor. Okay, and now if you look here at the top, you, I've, I've, I've drawn some single-stranded or some damaged DNA. Okay, now when DNA dam is damaged, there's some an, a DNA is then bound by this other protein called Rec A. Okay, and wh when Rec A is bound to, to damaged DNA, it can enhance the breakdown of this protein. So the damaged DNA effectively triggers the breakdown of this repressor so that it can't go back and bind. And because these are binding and leaving and binding and leaving, they're, they're, they're sort of cycling on and off, the damaged DNA breaks down these to reduce the pool, so effectively these genes are then turned on because you're removing the, the repressor because the DNA damage activates these proteins. So effectively, as these are cycling around, once these are in place, they cause breakdown of um, the cleavage of the the Lex A, and then the Lex A can't act as a um, repressor anymore. So as, as it cycles on and off, it gets broken down by this protein, which becomes active because it's bound to the DNA, and therefore the repression is relieved. So damaged DNA causes the breakdown of this repressor protein, which then allows the genes to be turned on. Um, okay, so again, it's one of these kind of You'd never dream it up. It's just something that has evolved as a process. And it makes complete sense when you think about it. You go, oh, well, that's actually quite smart. Because um, I can't imagine how damaged DNA would actually be able to come round and somehow trigger to the repressor of this thing to turn off the gene so it can make the protein to repair the damage. I mean, there's no mechanism I can think of that would do that. But this mechanism actually makes sense. You've got the repressor um, cycling on and off. And that happens normally. When DNA is damaged, a protein binds to it, its structure changes, becomes able to be functionally different. And then this protein now, when it comes into contact with this protein that's floating around, it causes um, the autocatalysis of that protein. Therefore, you lose your repressor. And then the DNA repair genes come into play to repair the damage. All right, I think. Oh, almost at the end. And then this is just a little schematic the textbook has, which shows that the, um, the Lex A repressor is binding to common sequences in the promoters of a bunch of genes. And these are a bunch of genes that are involved in DNA repair. So these genes have a common function, and they're co-regulated. Okay, that's a common theme in biology, that the, um, you know, the, the promoter has evolved in conjunction with the function of the protein. That makes sense. Um, so these are um, genes that are involved in DNA repair, and in the um, promoters of these um, genes, there are some common sites which are all bound by this protein. DNA damage causes um, those proteins to be degraded, and therefore, even though these genes are distributed around the genome, they are now turned on simultaneously because they are all missing the, the um, repressor protein. All right, I think that is it. Oh no, one more slide. Um, so in summary, um, Rec A is active um, uh, when it's bound to single-stranded DNA, and then it's the Rec A that induces cleavage of the, LAC, uh, of the Lex A repressor. And um, this works in part because you've got this cycling on and off. The Lex A protein is cycling on and off the DNA, and therefore it can come into contact with this other um, protein that's bound to damaged DNA. And, it, and it, it eventually, all of the Lexa is, is degraded um, um, to, to, to remove it from the cell. Okay, that's the end. All right, um, thank you for your attention. Um, if you've got any questions, come down and have a chat or shout them out, and I can revisit some slides if you want me to. Okay, good.